So even extra special today, on top of all that practical exercise stuff I got out to you, is we're podcasting today. So if you see that I'm all mic'd up, up. that's why, because we're going to put this online for you to review later. So uh, how many of you said you were agents? And you do have to interact with me because they can't hear your hands going up. Yes. yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Listen to that. So we have lots of agents. Why did you say you were agents? Yes. You know, from the chapter, um, employees are people who do things for other people, right? So if you work for a corporation and work with a third party, the public, the customer, then you are an agent. So again, I ask, how many of you are agents? Look at the numbers just went up. Whoa, yes, yes. So then we'll talk about, is there ever a situation where we work for ourselves, could we be an agent? What do you guys think about that? No. Yeah, I mean, like we're actually doing a job for ourselves and not for anyone else. Is that, but you mean, and you mean self-employed, doing a job for someone else, right? Right, yes. Uh, we're not talking about like cooking yourself dinner or something. We're talking about doing a job. So I'm an attorney, and I put a will together for someone. That makes me an independent contractor. Am I their agent? Yes, I'm doing something on their behalf. I'm not representing my own interest. I'm representing theirs. So yes, you can work for yourself, but, but on behalf of someone else. So a lot of times if you guys hear about subcontractors, you know, they're doing a job, they work for themselves, not for someone else, but they're still doing it for someone else, and that makes them an agent. So really, this is an important chapter because you all, or most of you at some time, have been employees, and at some time in the future, you're going to do things for other people. How many of you do things for other people and don't charge them for it? My girlfriend all the time. Right. Oh, you it's not going into a lot of detail, but... right. The rest of us, you know, we charge. <laughs> All right. So. Can your boss be the principal? Yes. Your boss could be the principal. In fact, on the practical exercise, um, look at question number one on that uh, sheet of paper I passed out to you. Your boss can be the principal but you have to be careful about what you mean by the boss, right? In that first scenario there, there is only one principle. So if you draw it out, not the boss, but if you draw it out, right, there's only one at the top, right? So let's say, let's say your boss, as you think of it, works for Lowe's, right? Lowe's is the principal, your boss is an agent for Lowe's, and you are also an agent for Lowe's. You just happen to take direction from someone else who is also Lowe's agent. So then it's the corporate. I didn't say that was the answer to the first question. No, but you're saying the corporation right, is likely an agent unless it's like they own the business. That's what I'm saying. So corporation, yes, principal. Uh, I run my own business, and I have employees that work for me. I'm the principal. They're the agent. Uh, there's multiple agents, right? I can have multiple employees or employees who work for supervisors. What's that? No. You guys under, you hear the question over there? What was it? Yeah. Is the corporation? So, no, that wasn't the question. That was like two questions ago. Um, the question was, could there be multiple principles? What? Is it on? Or what? I did say that, right? <laughs> now you're like three behind. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, oh, you gathered by the way I was talking that I was mic'd up. Gotcha. Yeah. That's right, darn it. So different than when the mic's off, right? It's just not even half glass. Uh, so, uh, the question was, can you multiple principles? That's the trap that people fall into when they start doing that first practical exercise because there's a corporation and there's a boss and then there are 
people that work for the boss, and so they keep turning and looking at the boss as the person the agent's working for. They're making them the principal, but no, they're the agent. No, but my question is, like, I work for Mike Mingle. Yes. 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 Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh, yeah, it's probably not like a bunch of guys in charge of American Eagle. It's probably more like a corporation with a board of directors. Yeah, so right. all of them people be the principal? Mm, they still act as agents on behalf of the corporation. Oh, the corporation is the principal. Well, actually, a corporation is a person for purposes of the law that we're talking about. We might be getting a little into too much detail, but actually, if you look at that question, it says... Um, what's the first one? Who is a principal? Which might lead you to believe that has to be a person, but it's it's no. Let me try one more time. There's only one principal in the first problem, and that principal is at the top, right? Is that what's that? If you say so, I'm not going to give you the answer. All right. So, um, partnerships, you know, you, you raise a good point. What if three of us get together, form a business? Yes, I would say that we all share the responsibilities of a principal and have agents that work for us. So, that part you'd be right about. Alrighty, so, we're going to talk about the difference between independent contractors and employees. We're going to talk about how agency relationships start, what the... Uh, liability is of the principal and agent while the agency is going on, and then how agencies are terminated. And you will also have a chance to participate in some live recorded drama today. You're pretty excited about that. <laughs> Could you yawn louder? I'm not sure the mic is picking that up. There you go. Thank you. All right. So, um, in an agency relationship, it says agency equal principal and agent. Most commonly, commonly, it's P A and three P. P is what? Principal. Principal. A is what? Three P is third party. Third party. Right. So let's say, for example, I want to sell my house. Right. That makes me the seller, but it also makes me the what? Principal. Principal. I hire a what? Agent. agent. What kind of agent? Real estate. Real estate. So sometimes agents actually have agent in their title. Right. So when you think of agent, you might be thinking of real estate agent. What other kind of agents are there? James Bond agent. More realistically, what else? Insurance agent. Football player's agent. Uh, yes, sports agent of some kind. You think of oh, Jerry Maguire or something. Well, maybe you don't. <laughs> right, exactly. And then who's this over here? Who's the 3P? The buyer. The buyer. Excellent. I would say that you're like my brightest class, but then my other classes hear this. And then they get all upset about it. All right. You tell it to us every other day, the mic's not. Shh. So, um, in this relationship, who is the contract between? So the real estate agent goes out and gets a contract on my behalf as a seller. Who is the contract actually between? Yeah, the principal and the third party. It's like the agent isn't even there. If I don't deliver the house, it's not the agent's problem. And if the third party doesn't come up with the money, it's not the agent's problem. So in a pure agency relationship where the agent is acting as they should be, it's like they're not there. They don't have a liability. So agency is really important. Like one reason I mentioned is because you ha are or have been agents yourself but also because without it, we could not operate in multiple locations. We'd have one place of business. Everyone would have to come there. 
Now we're international because we have agents all over the place. And if you are a principal who hires an agent, you should make sure there's someone you really can trust. Because while you have control over what they do as it relates to the agency, um, we're going to learn some things about agents, such as whether they have to have capacity, um, what kind of authority they have, where, um, wow, they seem to have a lot of power to act on your behalf and not be liable for it. In fact, if you look in your chapter, there's a power of attorney in your chapter. What page is that on? I know you all read the through that. No. <laughs> so, so you should just go tell your old high school principal, hey man, you were never a principal. <laughs> Unless they were the owner of a business who had agents working for him, then they'd be a principal in an agency. Which is different than Anyway, right. So uh, that is a good point. Minor point is, see how principal is spelled up there? Okay, that's the right way to spell it. There are principles, which is spelled differently. But yeah, there you go. The principal is your pal. Yeah, exactly. So uh, did you find, as I'm having this principal conversation. Did anyone, it does look, it looks like absolutely no one looked for the power of attorney. Where, where is it at? Oh, no, the actual power of attorney. It's big and it's in color, so you can't miss it. Look through your chapter and you'll find an actual power of attorney. On page 530. <laughs> okay, not the definition of a power of attorney, but the power of attorney that's in your chapter. Now, just glance at it. And by the way, power of attorney is not whatever puke color that is. I don't know what color that's supposed to be. But um, look at all the power that someone has as an agent. What kind of things can they do? Sue, demand, Sue, demand sell, sell, buy, execute. execute. So any document, <laughs> not well, you know, jeez, not execute like and kill someone, but sign on behalf of. So if you give this power to someone, you're giving them a whole lot of power. And when they make a decision for you, it's your decision. It's not even really their decision. All right, we'll talk about that a little more. So you have a fiduciary, which may be a new word to you, fiduciary relationship going on here between a principal and an agent. Fiduciary basically means trust. Okay. So if you're an agent, you have a lot of responsibility and as long as you meet those responsibilities, you get out of the liability. Okay. So if I'm given someone power to, for example, in a durable power of attorney, to pull the plug on me after I can make no longer make decisions and am in a persistent vegetative state, then it should be somebody I really trust, right? I don't know why that's funny. It's not really funny, but, you know, I, it, a power of attorney, you really want to give it to someone for limited purpose. That could be one of the purposes, and you don't want to give it to them while you're capable of making your own decisions. You want to wait until you're no longer capable. Then it kicks in and it makes a decision. How many of you have written that up, right, that if you were in a coma or become a vegetable that you want someone else to... Pull the plug on you. I'm going to go back and edit that comment about my smartest class. And, all right, so um, one thing we do need to do, though, to find out how much liability we're going to have is distinguish between employees and independent contractors. And on this next slide, 
here are some of the factors that you're going to need to look at. In fact, one of the questions on your practical exercise asks you who is an employee, who is an independent contractor. Okay. Employee and independent contractor. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I didn't. I didn't make the slide, but that's supposed to be employee and independent contractor. All right. So uh, here are some of the factors we look at. How much degree of control does the employer exercise over this person who we're trying to figure out whether they're an employee or independent contractor? I always think about uh, as I drive through my neighborhood. There's homes still being built. And I'll see somebody working and I'll think to myself, hmm, so I wonder if they're an employer or independent contractor. Don't you think about that? Yeah, I You just like come, you could come here yesterday and listen to me and get this. I don't think I said exactly that. Yeah. <laughs> what? No, it's all original. All right, so anyway, back to my story. Um, you see someone there, and their supervisors tell them when to take a lunch break, when to show up, what to do, when to leave. All right, what's it sound like they might be from listening yesterday? Huh? Huh? Don't you know the answer if you were listening? Probably an employee, right? Uh, versus, like I did use this example, now I'm nervous because if, if example I'm going to give you, you used that yesterday. Um, my builder uh, built the house and also did the cabinetry inside, uh, which is not always the case with builders. But the one thing he wouldn't want to do is what? Ah, no. Although he didn't do that. Something else he didn't want to do. Drywall. Anyone ever done drywall before? Yeah, I hate it. All right, I've done it myself, and he didn't want to do it, and so he subcontracted, right? And he basically told me, because I'd go in and check the house every day, because I'm an anal attorney that has to know everything that's going on, right? And, you know, he said, you know, you can go there that week, but I won't be there. These guys will be there all week doing drywall, and uh, just stop, just stay out of their way, right? So <laughs> what if you like listened to this early and then came to class and said you knew everything that I was going to say, right? So anyway, one day I come there to the house and they're playing what kind of music? Rap. What? <laughs> Rap music. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Christian rap rock music. <laughs> and, um, I mean, really loud. And as I walked in, these two guys on stilts. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to play insert the word with you guys. because right On stilts, right? I've never seen this before. And they basically almost ran me over. And I got curious, and I like, these guys are running through the house on stilts, and so I go into one of the rooms, and they're up on stilts, and they're, they're uh, mudding all the corners in the, the room, and then they run back out of the room, go to the next room, and they're doing, I, I couldn't believe it. Break dancing on stilts. Yes, it was like breakdancing on stilts. In fact, I'm sure after I left, they probably dropped and spun around on their back, right? <laughs> so anyway, my builder couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. So these guys had freedom to go in and do the things that they had to do, including bringing their own tools, another factor up there. They bought the boom box. They bought the equipment. They had their own van. right? They basically worked for themselves and were doing a job. Now my builder would come in and he'd re leave them little notes. He'd write on the wall or tell them something. But other than that, he didn't tell them how to do their job because they knew how to do their job. Another thing that we might look at is how people are paid and how long they're employed. 
these guys that are doing drywall, they don't just keep working only for my builder. They're going all over the place doing different jobs for different people. How do you get paid as an employee? Cash. What? Bi-weekly check. Um, so sometimes with these independent contractors, they do a job, they build a job, then they get paid. Now the Yes. Yes. Yeah. For example, if an attorney did a job for a client, they're not actually acting on their own behalf. They're acting on behalf of their client. So they're an agent for their client. All right. Um, last but not least, and this might seem a little insulting, it says, is there a great degree of skill required? If there is, you're an independent contractor. If not, you're an employee. But that's not true. There's Highly skilled employees that do great jobs at things. <laughs> um, but the idea is, for example, you know, my builder uh, typically would not have an advanced skill at cabinetry or something like that. Right? That he would do the general stuff, and then he would hire people to come in and do the rest. All right. So we don't look at any of these factors alone, but we look at them together. Um, there was a case of a truck driver who's driving down the road, and he pulls over, walks across the highway, goes into a truck stop, and um, six hours later he comes out, and he's, you didn't remember that part, did you? Drunk. Right, he's trashed. He's six hours later, he's, he's wandering out into the highway, going over his truck. Uh, motorcycle come by and run him over. Right, he dies, the guy in the motorcycle dies. Widow of the guy in the motorcycle sues who? The employer. Right, the trucking company. Why? Because between the trucking company and a dead drunk guy in the middle of the road, who's got more money? Exactly. So, well, that's the question, and when distinguishing between an employee or an independent contractor, what's one of the things we're going to do when we look at the truck? See if it's in the the right. You know, is it one of those independent contractors where they drive for other people or is it a company truck? So when they saw the name of the company on the side of it, ah, perhaps they'll have tort liability. What do you think in that situation? I haven't really got to this on the slides yet, but does that sound like something that's, if he is an employee, is within the scope of his employment? <laughs> Drinking for six hours? Yeah, no. No. <laughs> Good job if you can get it, but no, that's <laughs> typically not what uh, employers want you to do. Exactly. Yeah, the end wasn't too good. Right? So if someone is an employee, then you as the employer have tax liability. If you've been an independent contractor, what do you get at the end of the year? A 1099, right? Which says, hey, look, we paid you, but we didn't take any taxes out. Guess what? Surprise your problem. Hope you anticipated this because you're going to have to come up with the money to pay the taxes. You uh, could also have contract liability. Again, if your employees are acting on your behalf and enter into contract for you, you've got liability. If they're not acting for you, then you don't have contract liability. And finally, tort liability, which is a tough one. If your employee commits a tort during the scope of their employment, you, the principal, the employer, can be liable for it. All right, so how are these agency relationships formed? They're consensual. You can't make someone be your agent for you. No consideration is required. Remember, consideration was required for contracts, but you can actually do something for someone else and not charge them to do it, even if it's not your girlfriend. So um, here's a weird one. The principal needs contractual capacity, but the agent doesn't. Remember what capacity was in the contracts chapter? 
or the crimes chapter or the torts chapter. What's that? Mm, no. Right. That's exactly what it means. Your ability to enter into a contract and understand what it is you're doing. So that bullet says your agent could be what? When you think about the types of things that influence incapacitated, a minor, uh, a drunk, uh, on drugs, a drug dealer, insane. Right? So when I hire a real estate agent to sell my house, they could be a drunk, addicted, insane person. It wouldn't be very good, right? Because they might do things on my behalf I don't want them to do. All right? So we definitely want to be picky about who we pick as our agents because it's my contractual capacity that matters, not the agents. And I can have an agency for any legal purpose. Most commonly, we enter into an express agreement, oral or written. When I, I was selling my house, I entered into a six-month contract to have a real estate agent sell it for me. It was written. There are certain things that are implied when we do that. Not everything is written in a real estate contract. In fact, there's a picture in your chapter of a guy standing beside a real estate sign. What page is that on? So, well, that's not it. Yep, 527. Well, I guess it depends on your perspective. You could behind it if you're on the other side. All right, so, <laughs> yeah. So here's this agent, and he has a written agreement. It's there in his briefcase to sell your house, he works for Riga or Regal, I guess, and that couple there wants to buy your house. Okay. There are certain things that might be implied in that. For example, maybe there's not a real uh, written agreement about sticking that sign in your front yard, but it's implied if they're going to sell your house, they're going to do those kind of things. Okay. Now, let's say you told the agent Sell my house, but whatever you do, don't sell my dog. dog. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. So um, a year goes by, still not even a single offer. And then all of a sudden, this couple shows up here, the one in the picture, and they say, we'll take the house. And we'll give you the, the asking price as long as you throw in the dog. Right? Yeah, it would have been, but you didn't say anything. I mean, that's what I got to work with. Let's, let's say it's a, it's a porcelain dog. I'm a collector of fine porcelain dogs. Right? So they walk in and they're like, oh, honey, she says to him, I have to have this house. Look at those porcelain dogs beside the fireplace. Right? Now, my agent has no authority to sell the dogs with a house. But the agent says, done, you got a deal? We'll throw in the dogs, right? Now he comes back to me and he says, got good news and bad news. Good news is I sold your house for what you asked for. Woo -hee. The bad news is the dog's got to go. Right? Now, what are my choices? Say no. I could say, no, I told you not to sell those dogs. Those dogs are precious to me, those ceramic dogs. <laughs> I don't know. Yes, they're very, they're expensive, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm upset about it, right? Or I could say what? All right. All right. All right. So, I. Right. So, up there, agency by ratification. What I just described to you is if I say, I, <laughs> that's ratification. That means the agent had no authority, but I give it to him after the fact. Does that make sense? You weren't allowed to act for me and sell those doggies, but I'm saying that you can now. My wife never listens to these podcasts, so I'll tell you a story. We walked out. We were going for a walk yesterday. And we get to the edge of the yard, and there's a big pile of poop in the grass. And we don't have a dog, right? So, so um, she goes, 
Why? Why do people come along with their dogs, take it over to your dog, let it boop in your yard, and then not bother to clean it up? Well, then we're going down the road, we're walking, and some <laughs> lady goes by with a dog, and my son screams out, your dog pooped in our yard. <laughs> She's like, no, no. Anyway, that had nothing to do with agency, but I think it's a cute dog story. What? Because <laughs> they poop. <laughs> All right. Again, notice I'm keeping it clean because we're being recorded. That's true. It could have been my son. <laughs> what if my, well, it was, it was kind of tiny. I don't know. All right. Anyway. So we got agency by agreement. Poop. This is being recorded. All right. Uh, we have an agency by agreement, agency by ratification, and now agency by estoppel, which is probably a new word. You guys are probably, yeah, probably too young to remember Hogan's Heroes. No, I'm not going to do that. All right, so anyway, um, in your book, what page does it talk about this agency by estoppel? Five twenty-four. So, do you guys have you guys heard about the triple X domain? No. Good answer. So, no. Um, they're they're trying to push all pornography off into instead of dot com to dot xxx. And the idea is, if you're looking for it, then you know where to go. Versus if you search for it and it pops up. I only say that not because I had anything to do with agency, but now I can put that in the heading of the podcast, XXX, and then people are like, what was that about? <laughs> anyway, so on page 524, read example 17.6. Make sure that you read it because it will be important. I got some good questions for you when you're done. Is it confused? No, it's not the best example, but to help us with it, we're going to do a little drama. You lost? Yes, action will help. We're going to put this into action. All right, so is there anyone in here named Steve? Steve? Steve, would you have a seat up there? Please, thanks for being a Steve. <laughs> All right, Steve, do you want your script? Yeah, okay. Steve, you own a what? A seed store. Has anybody ever seen a seed store? <laughs> All right, stop it. Um, All right, so now I need a Grant and an Andrew. Grant, all right, come on up. And then I need an Andrew. It could be um, a girl, too. All right, Andrea? No, I don't really want Andrea? <laughs> I know, Kristen's your name, but... All right, so I need an Andrew or Andrea or Andy, one of those, you know. Yeah, I, I knew you had some drama in you. I knew it. All right, so now if you need your script, bring your script. We're going to start talking the theater lingo here. No, you don't need it. You're like, I don't need no stinking script. Memorize it last night. Yep. <laughs> Rehearsals. 
All right, so now here's Steve in his seed store. And uh, along come Andrew and Grant. Go on up there. You're going to call. Andrew. Both of us? Yes. Yeah. You're going together, right? And you're going to call upon Steve. There you are, right? Now, um, you are going to lead Steve to believe that Andrew has authority. Is that right? I got that right? Yep. Yeah. That Andrew has authority he doesn't really have. So what is it that you're going to say? And say it really compelling. Andrew wants to <coughs> What is it that you're going to say? Your line's in there. See it? Oh, did you hear that? Did you hear that? Right? Now, Steve, what do you believe? <laughs> Don't you believe that Andrew must work for Grant because of the way Grant's talking about him? All right, so now Grant. <laughs> I do, I do. All right, Grant, exit, stage whatever. All right, All right now you do your thing. Just sell them some seed. You're, you don't actually have all the seed with you, but you want to... Yeah. <laughs> uh, I knew this was going to go downhill. All right, so now you're going to give them a big wad of money. <laughs> don't be looking around my... No, you got a big wad of money, right? You're giving it to them. Yes, I do. All right, now what are you going to do? No, 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 no. You got... Lots of seeds. You run off. In the mail. Yes, the your seeds are in the mail. All right, good job, good job. All right, now, we're, this is not an example, but just to take this a little further so that people understand it. Now, here you are. We're going to watch him as he waits for his seed. <laughs> look, he's starting to get nervous. He's like, I paid for it. Wait, look, look. All right, now, your seed doesn't come. What are you going to do? There you go. Do <laughs> hey, Grant, you, uh, you got my seeds? No, I thought Andrew was bringing. No, 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 you don't. Wow. You don't even know anything about it. You're, you left. You're like, what? You, what seed are you talking about? You bought seed. I didn't know you bought seed. <laughs> and, uh, Andrew sold me some seeds. And he's your agent, right? Yeah, I don't even know who this kid is. I'm not getting you any seed, right? <laughs> so, all right, good job, excellent, excellent. <laughs> All right. I, so what I'm thinking, if you weren't thinking about theater or something until now. So what was the point? <laughs> All right, the point was the principal, Grant, led the third party, Steve, to believe that Andrew had authority he didn't really have by saying what? I wish I had a whole bunch like him, right? Okay, so now you give him the money, and now... He doesn't have the money, but he's supposed to produce the seed. This agency by estoppel says, you you ran off. Was I supposedly getting my seeds from Grant? No. You were giving seeds to Grant. No. Grant. You, just, you just scampered off, man. You just, you, le you leapt away. You were just, whoop. Right, yeah, you're, yes. <laughs> right. So, you weren't really an agent, but the principal made the third party believe you were. So what happens when the principal grant leaves Steve to believe you're an agent when you're not? Yes, that's what agency by estoppel is. If the principal is the one who leads the third party to believe the agent has authority that they don't have, then they can't back out. So that means you got to what? Fork over some seed or some cash. Yes. Fork over Well, you could make that argument, but... You gonna let him talk about you like that, <laughs> right? But does that make any sense? Yeah, it makes a little more sense than that drama help. All right, I probably should get some video going in here because the, just the audio, yeah, the audio alone doesn't doesn't do it justice. All right, so if it's not agency by agreement, estoppel, ratification, the law. <laughs> 
The law could step in and create an agency where there isn't one. That should sound familiar. Remember contracts, same kind of thing? Pretty rare. This doesn't happen a lot. Um, sometimes if your kid gets provided with necessaries, what would necessaries be? Food, clothing, shelter, those type of things, then there's going to be liability on your behalf. Right? Even though you're not the one that told this person to do it. The law just creates an agency situation. All right, so what duties, oh, you just know the law creates agencies. That's really all you have to know. And it's not very common. So as an agent or an employee, what kind of duties are owed? You owe a duty to perform. So my real estate agent has a duty to do what? Sell a house. Right? And if he gets an offer or he gets some money, what does he have to do with it? Let me know about it, right? Notification to the principal. Loyalty can come up. In fact, there's a case up there, American Express versus Topol. What page is that on? That's in your chapter. All right. Did you guys read that? Was that a no or a yes? I did, yes. Yes? What happened? Um, a financial planner for American Express, Topol, he decided to resign from work. Uh -huh. He got a whole bunch of investors in American Express to switch over to take to liquidate their investments from American Express and switch their investments over to um, like really like to invest in multifinancial, which right. I, which I believe was the corporation that he was joining up with. Right. And then even after he left American Express, he was still soliciting yeah. to the American Express investors to Good. change the money over. Good. So. The moral of the story is, good job, Joe, Just for the podcast there. Um, <laughs> while he's still employed, he's an agent, and he owes a duty of loyalty, which means he has to represent who, himself or the company? The company. And so if you're working for someone, even though you're quitting, you work for them. You don't work for yourself. So don't breach the duty of loyalty by sending out letters saying, I'm leaving, they suck, come join me, right? Now, he quits, he goes work somewhere else, and he continues to solicit American Express's customers. Is that a violation of the duty of loyalty? No, it's not. Very good. It's not because that agency no longer exists. It might be a problem another way, but it's not a breach of the duty of loyalty. Right? Sometimes things are pretty clear cut. You just don't send letters out to all your clients saying, come with me, leave my principal. Okay? Look at back at that picture on 527. This one might be a little more complicated, but it could happen. Let's say this guy in the picture, he runs a real estate firm in Grand Rapids that promises, if we don't sell your house in 90 days, we'll buy it from you. Right? And um, now here's a potential buyer who's willing to give $20,000 more than the seller is expecting. Right? Deny it by the house. <laughs> Do what? Deny the sale, wait 90 days. Right. I mean, he could, if he breached the duty of loyalty, he could do one of two things. He could say to the buyers, hey, I know they'll take 20000 less. That would be horrible, right? Or he could say to the seller, no, nah, they didn't make an offer, turn around, buy their house, and then sell it and pocket the $20,000. You like get some evil thinking going on there. But yes, I'm not saying that anybody in Grand Rapids that advertises that is breaching a duty of loyalty, but there's a potential for that. All right, obedience. Um, 
the agent should do what you tell them to do as long as it's within the scope of the agency. And accounting, if you're an agent and you get money, it's your client's money, not your own. Lots of attorneys have gotten into trouble because they take money that doesn't belong to them and put it into their own account. Right? So before they earn the money, they're spending it. Not a good thing. All right. Principles, duties to agent. Pretty straightforward. Pay your agent, right? And if I owe a commission to my agent for successfully selling my house, then I should pay it. Reimbursement if they have expenses associated with selling the house. Indemnification is a little different. Remember I said agents aren't generally liable, the principals are. If an agent ends up getting sued and they're not liable, then they can turn around and seek indemnification from the principal. Look, I, had, I ended up having to pay this judgment, but it's really your judgment. So that would be indemnification. Cooperation. If I didn't want to sell my house, but it would cost me to get out of the contract, what could I do if I were sneaky? How could I not cooperate with my agent? Right, I could not accept any offers, keep raising the price, I could trash the house, I could do all kinds of stuff. Right? Not cooperate with the agent. And I, as the principal, owe a duty to provide a safe working environment for the agent. All right, important slide. You'll need this for the practical exercise. Agents have either actual or apparent authority. Actual authority is either expressed, which means what? Written or oral, right? Implied means the conduct or facts lead someone to believe that they have authority. Right? It goes along with the agency. So you either have actual authority or apparent authority. We already talked about apparent authority. We didn't call it that. But remember that drama that we saw unfold in front of the class? Agency by estoppel? That was apparent authority. It appeared to who? Steve, the 3P, that the agent had authority they didn't really have. Same thing with the ratification. Okay? The agent doesn't have the authority, but then they're given it after the fact. What if um, an agent is specifically told not to do something by a principal? Is it that anyway takes the authority? It did sound like that, but <laughs> <laughs> we, we thought you said an Asian, but you said it, an agent. So an agent is told not to do something, right? <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> the agent's told not to do something, they go ahead and do it anyway. Right, because they take the authority to do it. They, well, they don't have the authority to do it, right? Right, but like in liability purposes, then what would that Well, be? in the ex two examples that we gave you, um, Andrew didn't have authority, right. and they went ahead and acted. But even though they didn't have authority, the principal was still bound under apparent authority. So even though an agent doesn't have actual authority, which is your question, could they bind the principal? Yes, if they have apparent authority. Now, how, I mean, think about this. You have a sales force of people who work with, with a, a customer list. How do you get rid of actual authority of your agent? Exactly. So you tell them, you no longer are my agent. You fire them. But what else should you do to get rid of apparent authority? Post it? No. Although that could be part of it. Apparent authority is what, again? When who believes what? When a third party believes the agent has authority they don't have, right? So if you fire your salespeople, what should you tell everyone on their route? They're fired, right? 
Or it could be there's a new person who comes along and says, I'm now the agent, that other person is not. The agent, I said. <laughs> Let's be clear, we've all said agent. All right. All right, so you, you not only have to get rid of apparent authority, but you have to get rid of, I mean actual authority, but you have to get rid of apparent authority. So look at practical exercise number two. When you look at that second practical exercise, there's actual authority that's given in the form of a what? A written letter giving someone authority to do something, right? And then what happens? Right, then that authority is revoked. What's the problem? What's that? Well, yeah, one thing is it should be in writing, right? There's this uh, equal dignity rule that they talk about where if you give the agent authority in writing, you ought to revoke it in writing. And this is the reason why you do that, because what ended up happening in that second scenario? She went, she went, she went, <laughs> she went and used the letter to convince someone that she had authority that she no longer had, right? And now you're stuck trying to answer these questions. Did she have any authority, either actual or apparent? Right. All right, so we were just talking about equal dignity rule. If we put in writing that an agent has authority to do certain things, if we revoke that authority or limit it somehow, we ought to do it in writing too. And we already talked about powers of attorney. Those are a way of granting agents power to do things on the principal's behalf. Questions about what the equal dignity rule is or what a power of attorney is? I see all busily writing. Should I wait a minute? Okay. Time filler. Well, that's the that's the argument. Some people are really against it because it just makes a nice place for that domain to be populated with nasty stuff that's easier to get to. So you there? Actually, WhiteHouse.com is no longer what it was. <laughs> yeah, it's something else. No, I wouldn't know anything about that. Ah. All right, by the uh, rumblings, it's time to move on. So um, a lot of these slides that are coming up here are kind of reviewing the major concepts we've already talked about. Implied authority is not express authority can include what the agent reasonably thinks the principal means. Apparent authority is not actual authority. Apparent authority exists when the third party is reasonably led to believe the agent has authority they don't really have. And ratification we already talked about too. This is just in a list form, but basically the same things we were talking about. Agent acts for a principal even though they didn't have the authority to act. 
a principal hears about the whole deal and affirms it. So when you have that, you have ratification. Remember, ratification, ceramic dog. If you think ratification, maybe think of ceramic rat. I don't know if that will help. No. You can always go out and rate the podcast. All right. So this this is new material. Um, sometimes, most of the time, the principal is disclosed. So my real estate agent sells a house for me. The buyers know that the agent's not the owner of the home, and they know who the seller is. That's the most common. Sometimes, though, question or just you're waving or? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Good. If it, I'm, I mean, all of Grand Rapids is a buzz about the mystery plot of land and what it's going to be. What What's our prediction? Oh, all right. Was it some kind of vertical mall and all that kind of stuff? Is that what they decided? All right. So, yeah. Anyway. So, yes. Uh, that's an example of partially disclosed principle because we know there's someone else who's wanting the deal, but we don't know exactly who it is. Good. Undisclosed principle would be different. In an undisclosed principle situation, we don't know who the principal is because we don't know there's a principal. As far as we know, we're dealing with the person who's buying the property. So you could have some type of deal where um, a group gets together, hires someone to go buy some property, and then turn around and sell it to them. Why? Because sometimes sellers don't want to sell, or at least sell at the price like if, if there's a vacant piece of land beside the Van Andel Arena and the Van Andel family walk down there and go, hi, we'd like to buy your house, how much is that going to cost? Probably a lot, right? So sometimes we don't want to let people know who we are. Or at least we let them know that there is someone else, but not reveal who that is. All right, that matters because the less we know about the principal, if they are concealed, then the agent may have some liability. That makes sense? The more we make it look like we're the buyer, even though we're really just the agent, the more likely it is that we could have personal liability. So generally agents don't have liability for the principal but if they don't reveal who the principal is, they might have liability. And I'm going to skip some slides here. If your agent commits a tort and they're your employee, you as the employer may have responsibility under a doctrine called respondeat superior, which means the superior is responsible. And so basically, um, I don't know if I should do this on the podcast. This is a little, this is rated R, but um, yeah. Um, detour versus frolic. Anybody know what a frolic is? When you're, when you're, yes, when you're playing, right? So when I was a prosecutor in Battle Creek, there was a truck stop between uh, Kalamazoo and uh, Battle Creek, what? He said something. Oh, okay. He knew right away where that was at. And it was known for two things. It was known for. <laughs> it was known for um, crack cocaine and transvestite hookers. All night, what I said. Yeah. Clean what you said. And so. Um, what would happen is the guys would be truck driving within the scope of their employment, 
and then they would pull in and frolic. Um, they would <laughs> they <laughs> they would smoke a little crack, and then they would get uh, their judgment would be impaired. We're not going anywhere yet, by the way. Uh, their judgment would become impaired, and um, then along would come a rather attractive dude who <laughs> would say, you know, can I come into your sleeper and, and you know, frolic, and, and then, then get beat up and mugged. So I'd always see them in court with a big old black eye, and then I would see the defendant. And I have to admit, even not under the influence of crack, to me they looked rather attractive. I just, just say that. <laughs> I did, didn't I? But not as not as attractive as you, honey. Right. Um, and so I, I I see how it happened. Right. All right. So um, is is transvestite hookers. All right. Let's uh let's finish up with this though. Um, uh, let's not. Pretty much, well, if you look at this, all, this, all these factors are the same. This is to determine whether something is within the scope of employment or not. Uh, obviously, we know smoking crack and, and um, going back into sleep with transvestite hookers is not within the scope of employment, right? So we don't need to spend a lot of time on that. Um, if during the scope of employment we commit serious crimes, then there's less likely, it's less likely the principal will be liable. For example, I'll end with this little story. This is a, this is a G version. Um, remember Domino's Pizza, 30 minutes or less? Right? And um, the first few drivers who didn't get to pizza there in 30 minutes or less got fired. So what did that tell all the other drivers? You better speed, right? So drivers started speeding, people started dying. The estates of the people that got ran over by the pizza drivers sued who? Pizza Hut. Not Pizza Hut. What does Pizza Hut have to do with anything? <laughs> yeah. So, so that yeah, they, good. They didn't sue the poor guy driving because he didn't have any money, but they sued Domino's Pizza and Tom Monahan, if you don't know who that is, because because that was where the real money was. Do you think? There was liability because, because Domino's never said, go out there and get that pizza there 30 minutes or less. I don't care how many people you run over. Technically, they did. Yes, yeah. they still have liability if you know your employees are doing that kind of stuff or you make them do that kind of stuff. And you know that they had liability because when's the last time you heard that 30 minutes or less slogan? Wow. <laughs> right, before they got sued. All right. I can't remember the name. We start calling them. I'll see you. Yeah. <laughs> see you next time or I won't. Oh, right, he's, he's going to lose it, guys. <laughs>